In this episode, we speak with Rick Song, co-founder and CEO of Persona, a company that enables businesses to seamlessly verify customer identities with a drop-in widget that can be integrated in less than 10 lines of code. Persona is backed by Founders Fund, Index Ventures, and Co2, among other investors. The company has raised over $200 million since its founding in 2018. Prior to founding Persona, Rick was an engineer at Square, and during college, was a KPCB engineering fellow. I'm your host, RJ Lumba. We hope you enjoy the show. Rick, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. It's a delight to be with you. Likewise. Thank you so much for making the time today. Absolutely. So I recently had to fill out some information online for a financial institution, a fairly well-known large one. And I was asked to enter in my social security number. It made me pause because it made me think immediately identity theft is bound to happen. But then I thought again, oh, well, but this is a big company. They likely have security in place and ways to prevent identity theft or my social security number getting mishandled in any way. How does Persona play into that scenario or how can it play into that scenario? I mean, there's a lot of things I want to talk about there. What's so fascinating right off the bat is that sense of fear that we all have about putting on our social security numbers now. So I'll first talk about kind of like, you know, how Persona plays into it. But I'd love to also just make a comment about like kind of the broader ecosystem that we see around identity today. For Persona, I think for you, you were able to build that level of trust because the institution that you're working with is hopefully reputable enough, well-known enough that there's already a baked-in level of trust. But for many out there, especially nowadays with the whole fintech revolution, as identity becomes increasingly important for all sorts of businesses, especially smaller businesses, they don't have that level of built-in trust from day one. They don't have that level of kind of sophistication to also build out the infrastructure to verify, to manage, to securely manage all the data that you've provided and also utilize in a responsible way. So what Persona offers is essentially that infrastructure for these smaller businesses. Anywhere from the collection of the information to make sure it's encrypted, in transit, at rest, to ensure that the verification of it is accessible, that the experience ensures that anyone can go through it. And you can do this all in just a quick 10 lines of code embed into your system. And regardless of what size of business you are, from collection, the verification of the data to the management of it, you have it all available for you in the same way that, honestly, I think what we've seen Stripe do for payments and what we've seen folks like AWS do for compute. So for Persona, we're really trying to do the same for identity. Taking a step back, though, I think it's even more fascinating on a broader landscape is, uh, first off, these days we've seen the leak of misinformation. I mean, most likely this fear that you feel is not just because startups mishandling this information. We've seen some of the most trusted, well-established institutions leak this data time and time again. And I think if we also take a look at it, it's like it's fascinating. The average consumer feels more sensitive about putting in their social security number than they do the credit card number. And I think that's just a wild kind of ecosystem that we put in. I mean, frankly, if you put in your credit card number, there's a very direct line to converting this into capital, whereas your social security, it requires a couple of hops. On a broader basis, what Persona is really trying to do is change that, make it such that you put in your social security in the same way you do your credit card, which is there's a certain degree of, you know, like sensitivity around it, but we feel that ease again. And commenting on the broader landscape, I think what's really transformed over these past 20 years, a story I always love to tell folks is about 20 years ago, I want to make actually a purchase online. I was just a kid at that point. So, you know, want to actually uh, buy a video game online, truly an innovation at that time, I suppose. And my parents could not believe it. My dad actually thought that was one of the dumbest things he's ever heard. Putting your credit card number online is the fastest way to lose, which you can possibly have, right? Uh, I think that average American 20 years ago felt unbelievably uncomfortable putting in their card information. 20 years later, I think what's so fascinating is that my father now is just retail therapy away his retirement, right? <laughs> he purchases something coming in from Amazon almost every other day. And what's fascinating is that the way in which he's playing that information has not changed. It isn't like using some new payment methodology. I think what's so fascinating is that the entire infrastructural stack from how they ensure that the transaction is safe to how the information is managed is so much better. I think a similar revolution is coming for personal information where businesses, the onus to how they manage and store it has to be better. To verify, making sure that verification isn't just a check mark, but rather that individuals are also secured and the right person is getting access to the services. Great security on that end isn't just to prevent bad actors, also protect individuals' identity. So as we look towards Persona's longer-term vision and mission, that's what we want to change is that hopefully five, 10 years from now, you're being able to verify yourself. You're submitting personal information in the same way you're doing so with your credit card information. 
which is you just don't think too much about it because at the end of the day, both of those numbers are frankly just random numbers. Like it's, there's nothing deeper there. So. Right. Well, then clearly a gap between the security used by businesses today and the added security with which persona would provide. So how much risk are consumers exposed to today, given how freely we enter our information into various business websites? Well, it depends on the consumer these days. And that's the unfortunate truth of it. And I think it's interesting because there's kind of a broader spectrum of it all. If you are a highly affluent person, you very likely have a lot of protections on your identity as is, right? You're paying for a lot of services and also a lot of institutions help cover for it. I think the risk is really for the average consumer. And the risk, unfortunately, is rising day by day. The amount of, at this point, you can read stats on these days, and all these stats are unbelievably depressing almost to a certain degree, where 80, 90% of Americans over 18, their personal information has been leaked. And the problem, actually, in my mind, is not just that more information has leaked, but rather there are more services that you can have access to online as well. And I think that's actually the true risk. The fascinating thing is that 20 years ago, we also did not think too much about our social security numbers. You know, we knew it was sensitive. We never kind of kept at the same level, say, our bank account numbers or our credit card numbers. And I think what's really changed over these past 20 years, you know, 20 years ago, if you had your SSN and you want to go and like open up a bank account, you could try to fraud the bank once, but you can't show up in person 20 times with 20 different people's SSNs and be able to become, you know, like open up 20 different accounts. And if they caught you once, you know, you just come back in. That made no sense. You'd quickly be kicked out. The challenge I think that we face today is that half the new generation of services, what they've tried to do is facilitate and enable individuals to be able to operate faster and you know, be able to have access to services quicker, but in doing so, are doing so through online services. What the downfall of this is that now the average consumer, we're far more at risk than ever before because if I get access to your identity, I can go to 20 different neobanks and start like just trying to open up new accounts. The problem right now isn't just that they are at risk. I think the trend continues to elevate because there are more ways in which you can access an identity and utilize it online than ever before. I'd like to get into your background. You've got a very accomplished background. You went to Rice University. You were a fellow at Kleiner Perkins. How did you get into, that's a really coveted position, I think, while you're at university. How did you make that all happen? I I hope the folks at Kleiner don't uh, get angry at me for saying this. The fellows program is coveted now, uh, Level of prestige, I think, is a rather recent thing. (laughs) When I had joined it, that is not... uh, The name has always been prestigious, though. Kleiner Perkins is a prestigious firm. I'll be honest with you, actually. I had no idea what Kleiner Perkins was when I was in college. I think that the startup revolution is a rather new revolution. I joke with folks about this, but I knew the brand Schlumberger far more than I knew the brand of Kleiner Perkins. Uh, And I'm over in the uh, West Coast. No one out here really knows Schlumberger. So first off, I hope this does not come off as a false humility. So I appreciate the kind words. But at that time, it was far easier. I wish I had a more illustrious background. Uh, I think there's so many founders out there who I look up to and admire in terms of just how incredibly accomplished they are. Unfortunately, I think that for myself, it was actually, I was in the right place at the right time. If there's anyone that I have to pay a lot of credit to, it was actually my professor back at uh, Rice because I was on the fence about accepting the fellowship. I was actually very, very much on the fence because I was like, on one hand, it's a fellowship I've never heard of and off in the Valley, or alternatively, I could work at a more well-known brand at that time. And I got fortunate enough to bet on the right thing. It was actually my old professor at Rice who pushed me heavily to try that fellowship. His line at that time was, uh, take risks when you're young. Once you're older, you can uh, figure things out. So that was actually how we got it. Yeah, at that time, I would say it was just far easier. I mean, these days, I don't know. I hear about the applicant pool. It's like thousands of people. I'm like, my God. <laughs> and you were a computer science major? I was. Okay. And then Kleiner Perkins, that uh, presumably helped open some doors. So Kleiner Perkins was how I ended up discovering uh, Square. I've also never heard of Square before at that time. It was actually during that fellowship that they showed us a variety of the portfolio companies. And that's how I found Square. Uh, It was also during that fellowship where uh, I met my co-founder, Charles, who we were uh, effectively interning together at the same place. Also through that fellowship, I ended up meeting our first investor who uh, ended up leading our seed round at Persona. So Nowadays, they sometimes have me be a spokesman. And I always tell them that uh, 10 years ago, I wish I had greater foresight, but I got the right results for all the wrong reasons. I did not think too much of this. And frankly, I just thought it was another internship. And it's hard to connect the dots. The classic quote, right? It's hard to connect the dots looking forward, but it's always looking back whenever everything comes together. So I will say it was a meaningful fellowship. And how did Square then lead you to develop Persona? 
So I always love to tell folks this, which is I did not get into the identity space like off some sort of serendipitous thing. Every now and then I'm at these founder events. All these founders talk about how they've been entrepreneurial since they were like 10 or something, you know, their first lemonade stand when they're 13, or they founded the entrepreneurial club in college. Earlier, I'd mentioned in my lacking of an illustrious background, and that's 100% true. I did none of those things. So sometimes it's very, very awkward. Not only that, I hadn't been thinking about this problem until actually I joined Square. I, despite what some may otherwise say, I don't think it's common for folks when they're in college or when they're in high school to be thinking about identity as a problem out there. So <laughs> when I joined Square, uh, I was effectively, you know, brought onto this team more so because it was a problem that Square was facing. And in particular, the problem Square was facing at that time was how Square is evolving from a kind of payment processing business into an entire ecosystem of financial services. And through that evolution, one of the core discoveries was that how you have to think about identity is actually very, very different for each one of these services. So just to call out a couple to drive the point, it'd be like capital, which was the one I was really, really focused on, is fundamentally lending. And how you have to think about identity for lending is completely different from how you have to think about identity for, say, food delivery via Caviar. Caviar is no longer at Square, but at that time, right? Like for food delivery, for merchant onboarding, it was different from digital banking and instant deposits. So Square was kind of facing that challenge. I'd been moved onto that team to kind of help tackle it, especially from a fraud and underwriting perspective for capital, but also got exposure on a broader basis towards, well, if you want to sign up, say, for, you know, money transfer by Cash App, if you want to have access to alcohol delivery, if you want to have access to loans, identity was kind of, it was no longer this one size fits all. So that was kind of like the genesis for the idea around persona, because at Square, we were also thinking a lot about how can we unify all of these different problems and products into a singular platform. So that kind of ended up becoming persona, this idea around building a universal kind of a platform such that with the belief that number one, there's not a one size fits all for identity. And two, that identity is more a relationship than ever before. Whereas historically, we oftentimes thought about identity verification as a transaction. We're seeing it evolve into a relationship where it's fundamentally about not only the one-time verification, but the continuous knowledge that this person is who they say they are and that the management of the data is done well and unifying the two. So we're tackling those problems firsthand at Square. And it felt as if that it isn't even just applicable to just fintech companies. It seemed as if it was applicable to so much more as the digital transformation was taking place in the Valley. And so did this insight occur to you at Square? And so you decided to leave and start your own company? How did it unfold and raise capital at the same time? Like, what was the sequence of events? So the insight was there for a while, but actually the impetus to go off and start a company, I did not have at that time, actually. I was happy at Square. At a certain point, if you've been there for close to half a decade, I'm certain that there's some degree of like almost a comfort just staying for longer. I was genuinely really, really happy there. I love my coworkers there. I have nothing but the best things to say about Square or I guess Block now. I think it's one of the greatest uh, companies in the world. It was actually my co-founder, Charles, who I would say is like the missing ingredient to kind of sparking the entire kind of journey for us. Uh, Charles, one of my co-founders, he's my former roommate. He just moved out a couple months ago, uh, as well as, of course, one of my best friends who I mentioned earlier. He was at Dropbox for quite some time, and he's been focused a lot on data infrastructure, and he had a lot of interest in terms of building out a company, and he'd seen my interest on identity. So I've actually been working on this problem at Square for multiple years as well at this point. And he was the one who kind of like was the uh, catalyst for having us actually go off and start something. In terms of uh, raising money and all of that, soon after we started, I cannot be grateful enough for a lot of the uh, folks at Square who helped support us from Jackie Reese's to Gold Gold to uh, Andy Kimball to Ted Mao, who had all really helped us in terms of introducing, connecting us to the right folks, helping support us. Charlie Gao, who was another uh, engineering lead that I knew at that time, who later on went off and founded Lime, helped support us at that time. So when we went off and raised money, it was honestly driven by so many of the previous relationships that we've had built up over years. You know, he'd been at Dropbox for almost close to five years. I've been at Square about five years as well, who really helped us get our footing. You're backed by some notable investors, including Index and Insight. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with the investors and how they've added value to the business beyond just providing capital? So there's a couple of things I'd say in terms of like the first and foremost thing that I look for investors is not the value they add. And I know that they may run counter to some of the current kind of like almost a dogma of, I think maybe 
what people are looking for investors these days, but that's not the first thing I look for. The first thing that I personally really, really care about is alignment and true understanding about our business. Because I think that as much as investors can add a lot of value in a variety of ways, they too have a job and their job is fiduciary responsibility, producing returns, creating a great business. And I think what's far more important for investors is that two, three, four years out, whether we're doing well or not, we were aligned on the strategy and they knew exactly what they're betting on. So that way, whether we're in a board meeting or having a difficult conversation, that conversation is clean. What I told all of our investors at that time is that if you can help us, that's tremendous. And I mean that a lot. But at the end of the day, if I'm coming to you every other day asking for help, you bet on the wrong founder. At this point, you might as well be the one running this company. Like you did a bad job on that end. For a lot of the relationships with our investors, we tried very hard to make it very clear that was always the case. And I mean, we were always fortunate enough. I know the broader market climate now has uh, changed dramatically. So we obviously raised in a very different ecosystem. But at that time, it was a founder's market. So we always had kind of a lot of relationships and a lot of support and interest from investors. So as a result, we almost always could kind of like choose the right investors for us. And interestingly enough, we've never optimized for valuation either. We've never chosen the highest valuation for any of our rounds, which I always joke, maybe it means that I'm making terrible financial decisions, but I think we're always very prudent about raising valuations that we thought were reasonable. Even if it's a bit aggressive, especially in light of current market conditions, we always thought they were very reasonable regardless of what direction the market moved in. So as a result, I think the relationship with our investors have always been positive. It's always been very professional and kind of cordial. We focus a lot more on alignment above all else. That said, I think we've also been very fortunate that our investors have been tremendously helpful as well. Despite like maybe the rhetoric, they truly meant the words and they have like gone above and beyond. The number first and foremost is hiring. They've been tremendous on helping us hire, especially senior leaders. The introductions there, I think, are invaluable. And as much as, you know, search agencies out there can be helpful, oftentimes investors, half of their job is keeping tabs on the best talent out there and helping facilitate those uh, conversations. So the best investors oftentimes know some of the best folks out there, especially for leaders or executives. I would say almost half our executive team have been found through investor introductions, frankly. The second thing I'd also say is, frankly, for strategic introductions, whether that be for customers or for relationships, and they're exceptional at this. And especially when you're a little bit earlier stage, these days we're a bit larger now, so we can kind of carry ourselves. But when you're like, you know, at the A stage or, you know, even early B stage where you're just maybe a 20 person company, investors are amazing for helping facilitate these introductions that, frankly, there's no way they should otherwise respond. We're getting close to the end of our time together. I always like to ask a couple questions at the end here, and they veer more towards the, I guess, personal. I like to ask about a leader who you think is particularly effective, perhaps, you know, one that you admire, one that you maybe try to emulate in some regards, and perhaps when you're making a decision or trying to figure something out, you draw on this person and think like, oh, how would they solve this problem? Or what's the best way to handle the situation? Is there someone like that that comes to mind? So absolutely. And I think uh, in this type of role, so often you kind of look for guidance because to be perfectly uh, transparent, there are many days when I feel as if I have no idea what I'm doing. I think it's more so an alignment of circumstances that led me to where I am. So you look for folks with similar backgrounds, or at least for myself, I want to find folks who come from maybe some degree of similar backgrounds that kind of guide me on this end. And I don't know them personally. I don't think they're perfect by any means. Frankly, I was actually joking with uh, someone else here, which is I hope to never meet some of them because uh, you never want to meet heroes in the first place. You know, I, Instead, I can hold this idealized, perfect image uh, in my head before I actually learning the truth. But a couple of folks I've always uh, admired a lot has always been, um, I mean, Toby from Shopify. I think he's an incredible leader. I think Shopify is an incredible business. Obviously, there's some uh, competition with Square, but I think for Toby, why I admire him so much is he's an engineer turned founder. And I love how in many ways he was always an engineer first and continues to be to some degree at his root to date. You know, we worked on the same language in Ruby. He's a core contributor for Rails in the past. He has also spoken very candidly about his experiences as transitioning to CEO. Uh, he has a podcast out there that um, I've listened to where he talks about how he felt insecurity about you know whether he, at a certain point in the business, was actually holding the business back rather than accelerating it forward. And there are absolutely days where I worry the same for myself. If, if I'm doing the best job, I can't pick up know, uh, the right things to make this business better. So I think Toby's exceptional. I think Mitchell Hashimoto is also an incredible leader. He was the former uh, CEO and, of course, the founder of HashiCorp. His self-awareness, his humility, and how just how he engages with other engineers is incredible. And I've only heard the greatest things about him. So he's always someone from a 
And on a personal level, I've always admired a lot. And then uh, if there's any leader who I think has influenced me tremendously, it's my old manager, uh, Andy Kimball over at Square, who now over is at Cockroach. And I often try to say that uh, many of my former managers have completely transformed my life. So I've been very, very grateful for all of them. And there are many times which I wonder, you know, as we get into uh, challenging situations, what these folks would have done. Excellent. Last question. What's your favorite book? I apologize if this is a longer answer, but I, I love to uh, share this joke out there because uh, when I first uh, started kind of preparing for external conversations, which for any listeners out there, I was absolutely terrible at. But first, kind of, if you ever have any degree of anxiety about this, I can promise you mine is far worse. And uh, my first external interview was far, far, far worse. In fact, shortly after that, our head of marketing here was like, we should get you training <laughs> like as soon as possible. Like, you need to start like preparing for this quickly. And we cannot have you speak externally again until you actually, uh, you, you practice a little bit more and uh, get a couple of reps under your belt. And uh, at that time, there was a mock interview. And the first question, I'll never forget, the first question that uh, Elena, who's helped me a tremendous amount, asked was, what's your favorite book? And I froze up. I had nothing to say, right? So my immediate answer at that point, a little bit more genuine of an answer was, uh, well, I don't read too much, so uh, <laughs> I don't know. And she was like, don't say that ever again. <laughs> it's not a good answer. <laughs> that is a uh, common answer on this podcast. No way. I'm glad that's an accepted answer. I do tell a joke that, look, I admire how much folks out there can read. They clearly read at a far faster pace than myself. But if there is a book that I, I do quite like, God, uh, let me tell you, it is a very, very uh, dry book. It did influence a lot about how I thought about things. And it was actually my old manager who had me uh, read it because he was like, Rick, you're very good at half of it and the other half you're not as good, which was uh, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow by uh, Kahneman. And he was like, Rick, when you think fast, you're fine. You got to balance both. And so when I read through that, I'll tell you right now, that took a long time to read. It's one of those where I read before night and read for about like two, three minutes before I was weighing on you a bit. So it took a year or so to get through. It did open my eyes to so many biases that I have, how I think about things, and also just how, despite myself believing that my mind was so much more rational, how irrational, I think, our decision-making and how we think about things was. So uh, that's definitely one where I don't know if it's my favorite. I would never read it again, but I would definitely say it's one of the most impactful. Excellent. Well, that's a good note to end on. Rick, I want to thank you for taking the time. And by the way, all those reps did fantastic because this was a great conversation. I know our audience will find this very insightful. I really appreciate you making the time again. Very grateful for uh, this opportunity as well. Thank you. Thank you.